everyone, welcome back to Simming History, where we look at the history of architecture through the lens of the Sims. This week, we are continuing and finishing the build of the Elms in Newport, Rhode Island. Real quick, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you hit like and subscribe. It helps the channel out. Let's get to it. Last week, we started off with doing the first floor. This week, we're going to continue on to the second floor, which starts off with a gallery, much like downstairs. Off this gallery are seven bedrooms, six bathrooms, and a sitting room. I didn't film decorating this gallery because it's quite similar to the first floor, but it does have red damask walls, two 16th century tapestries on either side of the sitting room door, and there are less collectible displays. But just like the first floor, we still are seeing that same purple marble pilasters. The first room we're going to start with is a guest room right off the top of the stairs, the Rose Room. Now in the Rose Room, all of the woodwork is painted kind of a creamy white, but everything else is pink. The walls have a pink silk damask, the rug is pink, the bedding is pink, the curtains by the window are pink, and at the bed it's got that kind of princess style curtain above the headboard and that is pink. The Rose Room also has a marble fireplace, and of course, wall sconces similar to what we have seen throughout the rest of the house. Across from the Rose Room is the Satinwood Room, which is another guest room. The Satinwood Room is named for the furniture, which is made of satinwood, and is an English neoclassical style was popularized by an architect named Robert Adams. In the front corner of the house is a room called the Van Allen Room. This room is largely occupied by Mr. Berwin's sister. The walls are kind of a grayish damask, and there's cream upholstered furniture. Like in all the rooms, the damask silk walls have this rope detail running along the corners and along what would be the edges of the fabric. Next up, we have Mrs. Berwin's room. Like most wealthy couples of the time, the two had their own separate bedrooms. Mrs. Berwin's room was done in Louis XVI style. It has cream wood furniture with fabrics and upholstery done in creamy pinks and greens. Its wallpaper is likewise a creamy kind of pink and green damask. It has a marble fireplace, which shares a trim chimney with the neighboring room which belonged to Mr. Berwind. Her bathroom, of course, is probably the most well-appointed in the house. I mean, wouldn't yours be if you owned this house? Mr. Berwin's room right next door 
has a fireplace that keeps with the coloring of the rest of his room, using a marble that's called ox blood for its red coloring. The walls are wood paneled with red damask, which matches the rest of the red upholstery and fabrics throughout the room. His room is also furnished with a writing desk and a bookshelf. The upstairs sitting room, which sits in the middle of the hall, would have been the space where the family would relax away from the public section of the house. So this would have been just limited to the family and the guests they may have had staying there. Like much of the second floor, it's done up in Louis XVI style with Louis XVI style woodwork and red damask walls. Next up, we've got two rooms that are kind of side by side. First is a linen closet, which is filled with cabinets that store all of the linen for the second floor. And another guest room that's called the gold room. So called because, well, it's all gold. This one is probably the most overwhelming when you actually go to visit it because it's on the smaller side and it's yellow everywhere. It's furnished in Louis XV style and as of at least 1994, it still retained its original silk wall coverings. And like I said, per its name, this room, room is done up in yellows and golds. And this last corner is another guest room called the Green Room, so named for its green walls. This room is the mirror room of Mrs. Berwin's room and is therefore one of the larger guest rooms. And it's well appointed with not only a bed, but a sitting area in front of its fireplace. Each of the bedrooms on the second floor had an attached bathroom of some form or another. Each of the bathrooms more or less have the same layout and certainly the same finishes. They have white tile floors, white tile walls, they each have a bathtub and a sink, occasionally a dressing table, and a toilet hidden by what looks like a wicker chair. It's only in the servant's portion of the house that we see an unadorned toilet. In this very last corner of the second floor, much like in the first floor, is kind of the servant's section. It has the stair that goes from the basement all the way up. And it also has, on this floor, a sewing room. When clothing was laundered, all of the buttons and lace would be meticulously removed by staff and then sewn back on after the clothing had been washed. This is due to the fragile and expensive nature of the handmade buttons and lace that would have adorned the family's clothing. Can you imagine trying to wash something that had silk lace that may disintegrate? Or pearl buttons? No. It was easier and more cost effective and did not ruin the garment to just simply remove those objects and sew them back on later. 
Above the second floor is the hidden third floor. I say hidden because it's very literally hidden behind the outer parapet wall of the building. On this floor would have been the servants' bedrooms, skylights going down to the second floor, and cisterns. Huge water cisterns were located on the tops of the buildings at Newport to provide the water pressure needed for the indoor plumbing fixtures below. Unlike some of the counterparts in Newport, the Berwyn's house, being relatively new, sported individual bedrooms for the staff, and many homes you had to share, but not here. This is largely because it was becoming difficult to get staff. Less and less people needed to go into service to be able to make a living for themselves. So it made sense to actually provide amenities for your servants, such as outdoor space. The outdoor space on the roof outside of your room, if you were a servant here, was yours to do with as you wished. Most set up outdoor sitting areas or potted gardens. But why was the servant's area hidden throughout the house? Mr. Berwin enjoyed the comfort of a full staff, but he wanted the house to appear as if it ran by magic, in other words, with no staff. So the servant's apartments were hidden by the parapet wall. All the servant's movement spaces, such as the stair, were limited to one corner of the house. And down at the basement level, the architect Horace Trum Trumbauer went to great lengths to hide how the building received their deliveries. On the side of the kitchen, the delivery cul-de-sac was hidden with a system of trellises and plants so that from above, you could not see it. The kitchen area consisted of two butler pantries and two separate kitchens. The cold kitchen, where cold dishes were prepared, and the hot kitchen, where the physical cooking occurred. Between the two cold and hot kitchens was a wall of operable windows, allowing the staff to see the going on in each room, but also the temperature outside the hot kitchen could be regulated by opening or closing the windows, thus providing some much needed heat to the rest of the basement during the winter. There are also multiple storage rooms down the basement where the family's luggage would have been stored as well as the crates and trunks staff used to transport the china and silver to and from the New York City home. When transporting china or silver, they were transported in specially made custom linings that created these kind of cushioned pockets for each individual item. And each item had a specific place it went and no other item could fit there thus ensuring each item could make it safely to its destination. There was also an ice and refrigeration room. The ice room stored the ice prior to use, and the refrigeration room was exactly that. Refrigerators, or as they were at the time called, ice boxes, looked like large wood cabinets lined usually in sheet tin. A block of ice would be placed in the upper section of the ice box, and the cold would then filter down to the food stored below. 
These areas also provided access to the root cellar where the vegetables were stored, and of course, the wine cellar, because what country home meant for parties is complete without a wine cellar. Next up is the laundry. Originally, it was a much larger room than it is today, if you go and take the tour, and it would have contained all of the necessary equipment for early 20th century laundry, sinks, agitators, irons, clotheslines, etc. Agitators looked kind of like butter churns or wood whisks, and you used them to literally agitate the laundry as it sat in soapy water, and it would literally knock the dirt out of the cloth. This aggressive stirring was extremely labor intensive and the laundry would have also been a very hot and uncomfortable place to work. On top of that, it would have been very dark. There was only, I believe, two light bulbs in the whole room. And these are not modern day 60 watt light bulbs. These would have been more like 10 watt light bulbs. At the very end of the basement was the boiler and furnace room where huge coal fired boilers provided all the hot water needed for the baths, laundry, and radiators throughout the house. Attached to this room is the coal room where the coal itself was stored. Both rooms have concrete floors and brick walls. The boiler's room's walls were painted white. And in the coal room, you can actually see the brick vaulted ceiling. The coal room is actually underneath the outdoor patio that is along Mr. Berwin's study and the orangerie. The coal room also has grooves cut into the floor for the coal carts and a turntable for said carts. Why do you need these carts? Well, typically, a truck would drive up to the side of the house, open the coal chute, and shovel it in. But if you remember, Mr. Berwin wanted it all to work as if by magic, and he didn't want to see any of the services from, say, his study window. So. From the coal room, there is actually a tunnel running underneath the estate and out to the street where in the wall at street level, there is a coal chute and a car would pull up, open the doors, shovel a coal in, it would be loaded into the cart and rolled down this tunnel and into the coal room. Here are some final shots of all the floors together. I did not record creating the stair in the servants quarter just because it took forever and was highly uncooperative. I also did not record the landscaping, because personally, I don't find watching somebody copy and paste a hundred bushes all that terribly interesting. But if you're interested in learning more about the building, I've included some links down below. You can actually tour the first floor of the house on Google Maps, and there's lots of videos of what the gardens and landscaping look like. If you ever get the chance, make sure you go and visit Newport and tour some of the houses for yourself. I personally can definitely recommend the Elms and its Servant's Life tour.